Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Okay, welcome back. So in this course, we have really focused on the silicon MOSFET. Now, silicon MOSFET, as we've discussed, is a barrier-controlled device. We control current flow by manipulating barriers. But we should talk about a couple of other transistors. There are lots of different transistors. So what I'm going to do in this lecture and the next one is to talk about two different kinds of transistors. And our topic today is something that we'll call heterostructure FETs made out of 3-5 semiconductors. But just by way of uh, introduction, you know, let me show you. We've been talking about the silicon MOSFET. Now, it goes by several names. IGFET is insulated gate field effect transistor. It's the same device. But you can see that there are many, many different kinds of transistors. This is just a partial list. Um, they don't all work by manipulating energy barriers, but most of them do. And especially the ones that operate well. And we don't have time to talk about all of these. You know, every one of them is very interesting. Some are being considered as possible replacements for silicon when we hit the scaling limits. But I just want to talk about one in particular called a HEMP. It stands for High Electron Mobility Transistor. That's the one we're going to be discussing today. So it's a transistor that's made out of a 3-5 semiconductor. So gallium arsenide is a 3-5 semiconductor. One of the advantages of 3-5 semiconductors over silicon is that the electrons have very high mobility. So if you're very lightly doped, pure gallium arsenide, at room temperature you can get a mobility of about 8,500 centimeters squared per volt second, compared to about 1,400 in pure silicon. So the mobilities are high, electrons move fast, they're high frequency devices. Now, for to get a high transconductance or a high on current or whatever, we need two things. We need lots of charge and we need it to move fast. So the high mobility makes the charge move fast, but we need to dope the semiconductor in order to get carriers there. So in this particular device, this is a device known as a Schottky barrier FET. Uh, gallium arsenide, one of the nice things about silicon is it has a native oxide that passivates the dangling bonds and gives us a high quality insulator layer so we can make MOSFETs. We don't have that good oxide for 3-5 semiconductors. So what's done is we put the metal directly on the semiconductor. There's a Schottky barrier there that depletes the channel. And by modulating the reverse bias, we can push the depletion further and modulate the current flow. If you draw an energy band diagram, it's operating by manipulating energy barriers. Now, in order to get charge in the channel, we have to dope it. So once you dope it, you get much lower mobilities. And this Schottky barrier is really not a good thing. We'd prefer to have an insulator underneath the gate so that we can apply both positive and negative voltages. Uh, when we have the metal connecting to the semiconductor directly, we have to be careful only to apply negative voltages and reverse bias to junction, or very small positive voltages. If we apply two big voltages that are positive, we'll forward bias that diode and current will flow through the gate, and that's not good. So there's a very elegant trick that people came up with in the late 70s and early 80s to produce very high mobilities, and it's called modulation doping, and it works like this. Let's say I have a semiconductor with a wide band gap and I've doped it n-type. And let's say I have a semiconductor with a smaller band gap that's pure. No dopants, the Fermi level is in the middle of the band gap. What we would like to do is to have electrons in this small band gap material because they'll have high mobility. They don't have dopants to scatter off of. And if I put these two semiconductors together, electrons are going to move from the higher Fermi level to the lower Fermi level and I'm going to end up then with electrons in the undoped layer. They'll have higher mobility. So that's called modulation doping. We dope one layer, the electrons transfer to the layer that we're going to use, and now we've got them there without doping. So this is what the overall energy band diagram would look like when you put the two together. We're showing a depletion on the wide band gap side, Electrons, there's a lower electron density because the Fermi level is further from the conduction band. That's because they spilled over into the smaller band gap side. We're showing a pile up of electrons on the small band gap side because those are the electrons that have transferred by modulation doping. 
that's going to become the channel of our transistor. And people in this field call that a two-dimensional electron gas because that's a quantum well that holds them. But it's just like a silicon inversion layer. A silicon inversion layer is a two-dimensional electron gas. The key thing here now is that we have the very high mobilities of undoped gallium arsenide. So let's zoom in and look at this a little more carefully. Here's our wide band gap layer. It's depleted near the interface because the electrons have spilled over into the small band gap side. Uh, we have a Schottky barrier that has some energy barrier height which depletes the electrons from the surface. We have some width of that depletion region from the surface. If we increase the reverse bias, we'll deplete further in. We have some depletion region near the interface because the electrons have left the wide band gap side and spilled over into the small band gap side. And we have a conduction band discontinuity that holds the electrons in the small band gap side. And we have some band bending, which is just like the surface potential in a MOSFET that gets set up after all of the charge is transferred. Okay, so if we look again at our, our electrons in this 2D electron gas, that it's going to be our channel, you'll notice we also have electrons in the wide band gap layer. So that's not good because those electrons are in a doped layer. They have low mobility. They're going to lower the performance of the device. So we have to design the device such that the wide band gap layer is thin enough that there is no layer that's undepleted. We have to get rid of those electrons in there. So we just need to make sure that we design it such that the width of these two depletion regions adds up to the width of that wide band gap layer and we don't have that parallel conduction channel. Now you might be wondering, why dope it at all? Why not just think of this wide band gap layer like the insulator in a MOSFET? And you can do that. There's just one problem. And the problem is that the band gaps here aren't big enough. And the conduction band discontinuity isn't big enough. In silicon dioxide, the band gap is eight electron volts. And the barrier here is about four electron volts. That's more than enough to keep the electrons in the semiconductor. But it's not enough in these material systems where both of these are three, five semiconductors. So if I apply a positive gate voltage, bend the bands down, try to get more charge at the interface, some of that charge will hop over the barrier and flow out the gate and I'll have gate current. Okay. Now, HEMP stands for High Electron Mobility Transistor. That's why it's so, so interesting. So we should talk a little bit about what limits the mobility, and that's limited by scattering. So what we've done is to take this wide band gap layer, transfer the electrons from a region near the interface into the small band gap layer. Now we have electrons in undoped gallium arsenide, so they don't have dopants to scatter off of. But they do have some things to scatter off of. There are lattice vibrations or phonons, so that affects the mobility. There's a little bit of roughness. These layers are grown by epitaxy and there are atomic steps. It's not as rough as an oxidized silicon dioxide silicon interface, but there is some rough, roughness there that the electrons can scatter off of. And these electric fields from the dopants that are in the wide band gap layer they actually extend the ways, and the electrons in the small band gap layer can sense them and can scatter. That's why we always use a setback layer. There's a layer that's undoped right near the interface to try to push those ionized donors in the wide band gap layer further away from the channel so that they have less effect on the electrons and scatter them less. So the design of these devices is all about optimizing the doping and the spacer layer and, and all of these properties. Now, when we characterize a material, we frequently measure its mobility versus temperature. So this is what bulk gallium arsenide would look like. At room temperature, pure gallium arsenide would have a mobility of about 8,000 centimeters squared per volt second. If we cool it below room temperature, the mobility will increase because we'll have fewer lattice vibrations or less phonon scattering. But if we continue to cool it, the mobility will turn around and drop at low temperatures. What's happening here is we're dominated by ionized impurity scattering. The lower the temperature, the slower the carriers move, the slower their thermal velocity is. The slower their thermal velocity, the more they spend, the more time they spend near a charged impurity and the more they scatter. So we'll get this characteristic feature. 
due to ionized impurity scattering and phonon scattering. Now the question is, what does this look like for modulation doped layers? And here are some results uh, that show you what you can achieve in these layers, and they're really remarkable. If you look at room temperature, we have mobilities of around 8,000 or so. Now when you cool it below room temperature, you lower the phonon scattering. As you continue to cool, if you have your setback layer so that you get the charged dopants away from the channel and you, do, you have very smooth interfaces with very uh, few atomic steps, you can get enormously high mobilities. You know, read that mobility there. That's 10 million centimeters squared per volt second. You know, these are just phenomenally high mobilities. So you can do lots of interesting physics in these kinds of films. If you lower the temperature down below one Kelvin and get these kinds of mobilities. Now, these are the kinds of structures that people discovered the quantum Hall effect on many years ago. So there's a, a lot of interesting physics that can be done and also interesting technology. And you know these films are grown by epitaxy in very ex you know, expensive and carefully controlled conditions. Uh, here's Mike Manfred's lab in, uh, you know, my, at uh, Purdue University. Uh, this is a photograph. What you're seeing here are the various sources that thermally evaporate uh, arsenic and uh, gallium and the various elements. This is a high vacuum chamber where there are, the background pressure is very, very low, so you can evaporate atoms. You give them plenty of time on the surface to move around and find the spot where they need to bind into the crystal, and you can grow extremely high quality films that lead to these mobilities in excess of one million. Okay, so how do we make a transistor out of these films? So here's a cartoon. It's basically like this. We grow it on a semi-insulating piece of gallium arsenide, so they're sort of like SOI structures. We'll then epitaxially grow an undoped intrinsic layer of, say, gallium arsenide. You can use different materials. And then on top of that, we will grow a wide band gap layer of aluminum gallium arsenide. The aluminum widens the band gap a bit. We'll dope that wide band gap layer, and the dopants then will spill in to the to the uh, gallium arsenide channel, and that will form the channel of our transistor. Sometimes instead of people uniformly doping that wide band gap layer, they put all of the dopants in a delta function at some position in there. That's called delta doped. And then we choose the thickness of that layer such that the depletion of the Schottky barrier just touches, depletes all the way through the film, just touches the channel, and now any voltage that we apply to the gate will directly modulate the charge in that channel. So that's the basic idea for a uh, heterostructure film, a modulation doped film or a high electron mobility transistor. And the channel now, like the inversion layer of our MOSFET, is that two-dimensional electron gas right at the interface. So people have used different names for this device. Some people call it a ModFET because it relies on modulation doping. Some people call it a HEMPT, a high electron mobility transistor because modulation doping leads to these enormously high mobilities. Some people call it a selectively doped heterostructure transistor. That's just another name for the same thing. Some people call it a TEGFET, two-dimensional electron gas field effect transistor. They're all diff different names for the same device. Now this is a little more realistic picture of what the device looks like. Um, many of the high performance devices nowadays are built on indium based materials because we can get wider band gap differences and higher mobilities in this material system. So the substrate might be indium phosphide. We'll grow some buffer layers. Then the channel material itself might have a little gallium in it because we produce a smaller band gap channel region that has higher mobilities. Then our modulation doping is done by replacing the gallium with aluminum. Aluminum widens the band gap. And then we can either uniformly dope that or put a plane of dopants in, and that will give us our modulation doping. And at the top, we'll, we will uh, deposit a metal gate. Uh, people usually use these structures called mushroom gates because it's important under high frequency conditions to have a low resistance on the gate. We want the channel length to be short, but we want the gate to be big enough that it has a low resistance. So this is a kind of structure that uh, 
is more typical of what people use. The layer structures can get very sophisticated. So here's a typical layer structure. Here's our substrate. We grow epitaxially a layer on top of the substrate just to get away from the substrate and get a high quality undoped film. The channel itself is a, is a heterostructure with a quantum well in the middle of it. The indium concentration is very high, which shrinks the band gap and increases the mobility in the place where the electrons are going to reside. Then there's a spacer layer to get us to separate us from the dopants. There's a plane of dopants. Silicon is a dopant in these materials, so that's the delta doping. Then there's a larger band gap layer. Um, that's our wide band gap. You know, these are both 48% uh, aluminum, which gives us a wider band gap than the indium gallium arsenide channel. And then there are some other layers on top here that are designed for etch stops for processing and small band gap layers to make ohmic contact to the source and drain. So the layers themselves can be, can be very sophisticated. Uh, what are the applications for these devices? Well, initially people were very excited about high-speed logic applications for these devices and it's proven to be a bit difficult, actually very difficult to compete with silicon MOSFETs, but they have very important applications in high-frequency RF applications, things like low-noise amplifiers, you know, used in places like satellite communication, radio astronomy, cell phones will uh, have hemp's in them as the low noise front end for the receiver. Uh, various types of millimeter wave power applications. You can see some examples of them here. You can actually do some uh, digital analog circuits, some multipliers, DMUX circuits, things like that. Uh, small numbers of devices, but devices that operate at very, very high frequencies and are needed for, for certain specialized applications. Now this is a 100 gigabit per second circuit, for example. And you can see how the speeds of these devices have increased over time, and the speeds of silicon are increasing as well, but 3.5s tend to have a speed advantage of a factor of two or so. So for those applications where you need very, very high speeds, um, these 3.5 materials will operate in regimes that just we are not able to reach by uh, silicon technology. Okay, now finally, uh, I just want to mention one thing. If you take a look at one of these, and if we just characterize it under DC conditions, this is a structure similar to the ones we've been, been uh, describing. It has an indium gallium arsenide channel, which gives you a very high mobility channel. One might expect that uh, the high mobility will lead to long mean free paths and near ballistic performance. So these are some devices that were built in my colleague uh, Jesus de Alamo's lab at MIT. These blue dots here, or blue squares, are the measured IV characteristics. The red lines are a simulation using a ballistic theory. And what you will see is that the device operates actually quite close to the ballistic limit. Silicon MOSFETs are roughly half the ballistic limit. Three five hemp's operate very close to the ballistic limit. So this is an example of a transistor that does operate close to the ballistic limits that we've been discussing, and that all comes about because they're built on very high mobility materials like indium gallium arsenide. All right, let's wrap up. So 3.5 FETs of this kind are an important technology when you need very high frequencies, RF applications. The transistor that we've been talking about currently owns the speed record for any transistor device. The one we'll be talking about in the next lecture is very close, but right now, hemp's own the speed record. You know, the maximum frequencies of oscillation, uh, FT and Fmax, these are two figures of merit that we'll discuss in the last lecture, but you can see frequencies that are above one terahertz. So these are enormously fast transistors. They operate, what's interesting is, if you draw energy band diagrams for these devices from the source to the drain, they operate in the same barrier controlled mode that we've been discussing for the silicon MOSFET. And that means that this virtual source model that we've been discussing and applying uh, actually works just as well for hemp's as it does for silicon MOSFETs. And it's an example of a device that you can consider, basically they operate as ballistic devices. All right, so there's one more transistor that I want to talk about. It's also a 3.5 transistor, 
It's a little bit different flavor. It's called a bipolar transistor. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Thank you.